All right, well, let's um, just have a quick uh, introduction so everyone knows who's here. Um, I'm Sally, I'm the chair of the Energy Committee. Um, Mike, do you wanna introduce yourself? Uh, excuse me, um, my, I'm Mike Gorey, Bristol Energy Committee. And Steve Wisbaum? You can say something if you want, like <laughs> who you are. Um, <laughs> Sally was uh, uh, reached out to me to see if um, I had could offer anything, any uh, advice or encouragement or ideas for spreading the Mo Electric message, and um, and it turns out that um, I, well, I've been doing that for four years, um, both just. Uh, as as the Northeast rep, sales rep for a company that sells electric lawn mowers called Bean Green Mowers, which is the mowers that, um, how I know Jay, um, Jay uses. And um, I was doing that for four years. And then um, as a, they were purchased by um, DR Power, which is owned by Generac, and they have a dealer network. And I kind of knew this was going to come at some point. Um, and uh, they didn't need my services anymore. So now I'm just doing this, um, you know, because I believe in it, which is why I got into it at the beginning. It just was nice, the prospect of making a little money from it. Um, uh, but so now it's just doing the advocacy, which is fine with me. Um, so, yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, maybe we'll go to Jay since you just sort of introduced Jay's name anyway. Hello all, I'm Jay Thomas and I own and operate Bear Mountain Mowing and uh, I've been doing all electric mowing in Addison County for, I'm going into my sixth year now. So like Stephen said, I've been using the mean green equipment all that time and uh, big fan of the electric mowing. Great, thanks for showing up. Um, and um, let's see, we've got a couple people from solar, three people maybe. Chris Cadwell. Yes, hi, I'm Chris Cadwell with Green Peak Solar here to um, present to you all an, an update on a project that uh, we're proposing in, in Bristol. Very, very excited to be back. Thanks for having us. Sure. And uh, Nathaniel? <laughs> Sorry, Even it's it's Lindsay. Lindsay, I'm on my wife's computer. It's got a little better <laughs> web, webcam. Um, anyway, I'm Nathaniel Van Der Waals, uh, Chris's business partner um, and co-owner of Green Peak Solar. And as Chris said, we're here to talk to you guys about a solar project we've proposed um, in Bristol. Great. And Troy Parity. Oh, he's in the dark now. Well, I keep getting booted out of every room in my house. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm now in... Uh, I'm now in room three, hopefully the last room. Hi, I'm Troy Parity. I'm a village dweller. I have a couple houses in the village. So I'm interested um, from just a personal standpoint about how to be better to the environment and, and do something for my own properties. But also um, as a member of the board of the Bristol Rec Club, you know, we mow a lot of grass in, in town frequently. So I just feel like we should be as, uh, as, you know, part of the the town, um, we should also be educating ourselves about what we could always do better there um, in the in the big picture of things. And Porter Knight also probably echoes both of those things for me. For me, yeah. Go. Thank you, I'm, Troy. Go I'm ahead, here, Porter. I'm just here as a public citizen. Uh, my lawnmower is getting old, and um, <laughs> the person who mows my lawn is getting older and he's not, you know, he's graduated from college and probably won't mow my lawn anymore. So uh, <laughs> I, might, I might have to mow my own lawn um, or hire somebody to mow my lawn. And um, so if I'm going to replace my mower, I thought this would be an interesting conversation. So just here to hear. Great. Thanks for coming. And Ralph, I don't know who you are, but feel free to um, pipe in and tell us who you are if you want. I'm just here to learn. Great. 
Welcome. All right. Um, let's let's go ahead and start, Steve. If you want to start the uh, your presentation about um, electric lawn mowing and the benefits and challenges and all that. So um, I'm going to screen share. You want to screen share? Yeah, I'll screen share. I've never done so that. Let me make before. sure I've got you. But. Uh, let's see. Trying to. Um, well, I, I can. I think I might be able to do it on my end, right? Or do you have to let me? Okay. I don't need to. I don't need to um, help you. I mean, oh, I have to say, okay, you can do it. So, okay, you do need to. Uh, I'm disabled. So yeah. you you need to. Um, yeah. You've disabled yeah. participant screen sharing. So oh, I see to, security. Try it again. Right there you go. You All right. You should be able to do it now. So here we go. So um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, good. All right. Now I'm going to go to view, slideshow. Look at that. Beautiful. Everyone see it? Yeah, yep. great. Yep. So this was, a, as you can see from the bottom, this was a PowerPoint I did at VCAN. Um, back in 2019, um, my company, Eco Equipment Supply, is where you see that logo. Um, and uh, so anyway, so um, as you can see, reducing greenhouse gas emissions with electric lawn care equipment, opportunities and challenges. So I'm gonna just buzz through this uh, very quickly. It's not that long, but um, uh, you know, the, the thing that really struck me when I got into this um, was um, just, I had a sense that there was a lot of fuel being burned and a lot of CO2 emissions, but until I you know, started to do some look at the numbers, um, it really hit home. Just what a huge opportunity there is um, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions through uh, changing lawn care uh, practices. So there's some numbers there. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> and then I've got, so nationally, and then I did some down at the bottom on the right, you can see Vermont's lawn care. I just, I just kind of came up with those numbers, their estimates, no one's done any studies. Um, and it could be, my sense is probably more than that, but um, you know, it's 15 gallons an acre um, uh, per season. Uh, and that's figuring about 23 mows. Um, and, and so it's really important to think about the difference between commercial lawn mowers and residential lawn mowers. And when I use, when the term commercial refers to any, any lawn mower that is like high horsepower mowers that you see contractors use, um, uh, municipalities, uh, rec departments, public works departments, those mowers that are 24 to 36 horsepower, um, usually they're either sit down riding or you can ride on the back of them, uh, stand on mowers um, uh, like Jay has. And um, then there's some also walk behind mowers. It looks similar to the old um, um, country home, uh, the DR mowers, those brush and field mowers, but um, the heavy duty ones. Um, so anyway, um, just wanted to make sure that was clear. Um, and then, and then I wanted, I thought it was really valuable to help people see what the difference is between electric and gas. And so, um, I'll just do this really, and, I, and I'm happy to share this, um, slideshow with anybody afterwards. Um, just, um, and this, a lot of this information is on my website also under the Y electric section. Um, so these numbers, 650 hours, hey, Jay, um, I'm assuming Jay might be using his mowers a little bit less than 650, but that's just based on, um, you know, like figuring five hours a day uh, or uh, five, six hours a day, five days a week times 23 weeks. That's where the 650 comes from. And then the 2.8 kilowatts per hour, that's, that's mean green. That's what they um, have uh, rated 
the, the amount of electricity one of their mowers uses. And that's a 24, 36 horsepower mower. Um, so, you know, you could just, you do, it's just math. And then, uh, so that's electric. Um, and then there's um, the 0.26 pounds uh, per, um, per uh, pounds CO2. I don't know why it says pounds per CO2, but um, that's wrong. I'm just noticing that two, that 0.26 pounds that's actually um, per, should be per kilowatt hour. So the, the Vermont Department of A&R did, did some research to look at what is the greenhouse gas emissions from a kilowatt of electricity that's, that's um, consumed in Vermont. You know, and that, that takes into account the production and that it's also sort of gonna be a balance between you know, what the uh, portfolio is, like how much of that electricity is coming from renewable sources versus non-renewable sources. But anyway, so that's where that 0.26 comes up. Um, and then the gas mower, you're looking at, you know, it, it's in the range of 0.75 to one and a half or one and a quarter gallons per hour, a typical one of these bigger mowers. So again, and then, so it's 728 gallons, and these are just estimates, but the 20 pounds of CO2 per gallon um, was kind of a shocker for me um, when I started to do this. Um, you know, you ask most people, even people who are involved in on energy committees and and who are who work in this, who are advocating for reduced greenhouse gas emissions, most people really don't know how many pounds of CO2 is produced by a gallon of burning a gallon of gas. Um, and it's 20 pounds. And um, the reason that it's more than eight pounds, which is about the weight of a gallon of water, let's say, is because it's CO2. So for every molecule of, or atom of, of carbon that's burned, it requires two uh, atoms of oxygen. So that's why it ends up being 20. And it, it actually is a little bit more for diesel, I think, but I just took an average here. So, and then I just did this, you know, figuring 10 electric mowers saving 10, seven tons of CO2 or a thousand, you know, it, it's just cumulative. And I did that, this, the graphic to really show, to make it clear that it's, you know, it's, it's a, the, it, the amount of CO2 is produced by a, an electric mower is a fraction. There is some, but it's a fraction of, of um, the amount of CO2 from a, a gas or diesel mower. Um, oh, okay, so um, these are, there's, since I put this slide together, there's probably another five mowers out there that are made. It's all of a sudden in the last decade, if any of you have been tracking this, um, every, all the manufacturers uh, are, are producing a very high quality, um, uh, electric residential mowers. And it started right here in Vermont, I think, with Newton, right? Did, did Country Home Products, I think they were the ones that came out initially with the Newton. And there, I still meet people who, who still have some of those Newtons kicking around. It's pretty amazing. Um, but the battery technology is really um, uh, improved considerably. Runtime, power, uh, these things are, are um, really well built and um, um, so there's a lot of choices out there. Um, and if you're looking for a comparison, there's a great, um, I found this guy, actually a customer told me about it. He does, he's online, he has a, a YouTube channel and it's something army. And he does these wonderful um, uh, comparisons of different technologies, um, electric blowers, electric mowers, um, and he's funny, I uh, highly recommend it. Uh, and what he comes out with, he, a lot of his, um, what his, the ego seems to be pretty high performance, but I, I have the steel, I like it. Um, but I, you know, most of these are gonna work well for most people. And they're, and they're in the 150 to $650 range. And then these are the residential riding mowers as distinct from um, commercial riding mowers. Um, and the one on the left, the American Power Products, 
they've been threatening to come out <laughs> and introduce theirs for years. And, and I don't know what's going on, but it's still, I don't think it's, it's out yet. Um, the Ryobi uh, is available from Home Depot. Um, I know a couple people who own them and they're happy with them. They're, they're nothing like, uh, you know, they're a little slower than the mean green, but, um, and then I don't even know if Troy built still making theirs, but, um, and mean green has a, they call it a prosumer model, but it's, uh, it's called the NXR. I sold very few of those because it's a 12, $13,000 mower and it'll do two and a half acres on a charge, but for a lot of people, that's just too much money to spend um, unless they're sharing it. And I'm happy to talk about that if there's time. Um, we're doing that in our community. We're sharing um, a main green mower. Um, and in the last five years or so, there's been a real uh, explosion in the availability of uh, robotic mowers. Has any, anybody in this, on this meeting seen one of these or know anybody that has one? So um, it's the one that started. I bet started, Porter will have one soon. <laughs> the Robo Mower was the first, I think. And uh, the woman that publishes the Green Energy Times, you're probably familiar with that um, publication, comes out monthly or quarterly. Um, she's, she's become, I think she's the sales rep for them. Um, but basically it works just like, I don't know. Is anybody in the, on the meeting uh, have a uh, robotic uh, vacuum cleaner? No. So it's the same concept. Basically, you have a charging station, and it and it knows to go back to the charging station, and uh, you have to set up a perimeter. They work different ways, but usually you're setting up a line very similar to a invisible fence, and um, and they just and it mows like a couple times a week because it's not going to mow. It, it's not going to mow more than an inch at a time or so. I don't know exactly, but you don't have to do anything. It just, it does it itself. Um, the woman, the publisher of green energy times said she hadn't mowed her lawn in like two or three years. Um, so, um, you know, anyway, there's a lot of choices out there for those as well. Um, then there's a lot of these handheld tools. And what's interesting to me, as difficult as it was to um, interest uh, contractors that use a conventional lawn mowers to switch to electric, in part because it's so they're so expensive. But I have a whole. We'll talk about the difficulty of that later. But uh, many contractors are now switching to electric hand tools because <laughs> they're finding that they work just as bad, well or better than the gas powered equipment. And they don't have to worry about ethanol, um, you know, vibration, fuel spilling, odor, you know, emissions. Um, the leaf blowers, most of them are pretty similar. Although when you're trying to blow in the fall, a big pile of leaves, um, uh, some of these guys are telling me that they're still needing to use their back big backpack gas mowers because um, the electric just aren't aren't up to the task but they're pretty incredible the electric I I, I have two of them and and uh, I, I would never have had a, a blower before until I started selling these these equipment I wanted to have a couple to try out and uh, I, I'm, I'll never turn back it's it's such a great thing um, I just bought a steel pole trimmer. I got, I bought the whole steel. And so that's something when you go with one of these companies, you pretty much need to stay with them because you're gonna get the charger, the battery is interchangeable. Um, uh, I, my initial, my first chainsaw, electric chainsaw was a DeWalt and they're not known for their chainsaws. And now I'm, I've got a steel, but I still have the DeWalt blower and uh, good stuff. Um, but anyway, um, these are the mean green uh, mowers that uh, Jay is using and I used to sell. Um, they were the first company to come out. They're based in Ohio. First company to come out with an electric mower about 10, 11 years ago. And Jay jumped on that pretty early. Um, he was one of the first. It was one other person, I think, in Vermont that started before him up in, uh, well, 
up in South Burlington. These guys probably started within a year of each other, but these things are incredible. They just came out with um, the next generation, essentially. Um, that Evo is a 74 inch mower. Um, and then the rival is, you know, touchscreen digital display. It's very high tech. In fact, I'm, I'm selling my demo. <laughs> I have a rival 60 that I'm selling now that at, at a discount. And then up in the right, they're coming out, they're working on a, um, there's a couple companies that are coming out with um, autonomous uh, uh, commercial mowers as well now. Uh, and then there's Greenworks is the other major manufacturer of, of commercial electric mowers. Um, it's a pretty good mower. Um, you know, Greenworks is, it's a, they're made in Asia and, you know, they're, they're probably not quite as good as, as the uh, mean green, but, um, uh, and the, the runtime is a little less. So they're not really, they're not going to work for contractors at this point. It's like a four or five hour runtime, um, which is not enough for most contractors. Uh, who's using electric mowers? Uh, I just put this together last night. Um, Greenside uh, was the first, I think. Jay, is that true that uh, Scott started before you? Uh, he did, yeah. He, he was using, for a year or two before I started, he just had a little electric push mower. Oh, and, right. Uh, yeah, before he got his Mean Green. I think wow. I had the Mean Green commercial equipment before him, but he was doing uh, some wow. jobs with the handheld stuff. So, you know, you you guys were you <laughs> the leading edge, exactly. really. You really were. Um, and then... Um, the Heart and Soil is a conventional operation that just bought a mower this year. I thought he was going to buy a Mean Green. I don't know what he ended up with. He hasn't returned my calls. Um, don't know what happened, but he may have ended up with the uh, Greenworks just because the price was lower. Um, unfortunately, he's going to find out the hard way that it's not going to work well for him. And then this KT Landscaping was an interesting story. They were the contractor for... Um, uh, uh, Wake Robin, right around the corner from me. And Wake Robin, the people there just said to their, the administration there, we're, they were tired of listening to lawnmowers. And they finally got the, um, the management to tell KT Landscaping, either you go electric or we're finding another um, uh, contractor. So they bought um, two, uh, also, they also bought Greenworks, which anyway, it was unfortunate. He got a, he, Figured he was saving some money, but yeah, I don't think they, it's worked out well for them. Um, and then Greener Lawn Care um, is the guy, Scott, that I was just referred to with Jay. Um, and there's Bear Mountain, which is Jay. Um, there's a company way up in Orleans, one guy. Um, he just did the math. He, he wasn't into it for the environmental reasons. He just did the math and he realized it was gonna save him money. And he bought um, a, a Ming Green mower, probably two, two or three years ago. And then there's um, a guy in Windsor uh, who used to work for Sun Common. Um, oh boy, Tim Roper, some of you may know him. He just started last year. And then this Zen Lawn and Garden in, in Waterbury area, um, they were just using a push mower, but uh, I don't know what they're doing now these days. But, and then uh, in terms of who, who was using these mowers in Vermont, right now. And I'm just mostly familiar with the ones that, mean, that bought Mean Green. Um, there may be some more that are using uh, Greenworks, but um, uh, so Burlington Parks and Rec now owns three mowers. Um, just this year, they bought them. Um, took me three years of marketing to them, I think. Um, uh, Burlington Electric Department uh, bought one. Um, right after they created or as part of their incentive that, that I'll talk about. Um, our, my homeowners association um, has, has one that we share among I don't know, 16 residences. Um, Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation up in uh, the Northwest uh, bought a, a Ming Green a couple years ago. And then there's a farm. Um, there might be a few others around, I can't, but uh, there's a pretty good number now. There's probably, I figure there's about 30 commercial electric lawnmowers being operated in Vermont. And that is up from about, well, one when Jay started. <laughs> when was that? What year was that, Jay? Uh, that was 2016. 2016. So in five years, 
we went from one to 30. Pretty amazing. Um, and then here's just some pictures of, I just threw together. Um, top left was I was doing a demo for the Vermont Parks Department. Um, they put an order in. I mean, once people see these things, like, oh, okay, these, this is a real deal. Um, Dartmouth did the same thing, did a demo, put an order in within a month. The guy there looking on that stand on mower, that's um, Churchill Landscape, uh, Greener Lawn Care. Um, guy on the right is a homeowner. Guy on the left, by, left uh, second to the bottom, he's an old homeowner, just bought that mower this, uh, this summer. Um, picture of stretched out photo of the solar panel, that's uh, Burlington Electric Department. Another homeowner. Me at the Warren Parade. Anybody go to the Warren Parade in the last few years? It's an amazing event if you've ever never been to it. Of course, they didn't do it this year, but uh, 14,000 people show up for that event. Um, that's Jay on the left and then uh, Dartmouth. Okay. Um, so real briefly, I would just want to mention um, one of the things that I did to... Um, promote um, electric lawn care, I figured that there should be incentives. So my first marketing call was to Green Mountain Power and uh, it took 18 months, but eventually they, um, they were able to get it together. No one had ever done this before, uh, created incentive based on greenhouse gas emission reductions for uh, electric lawnmowers. So it had to go through a whole review process and, and it was a $700 initially, and then they just kicked it up this summer to $2,500 because they told me they knew it was the right thing to do. And then, um, then they added a $50 residential electric mower incentive um, following the lead of Burlington Electric, which was the next one. They launched this in the spring of 2019. It became the most popular incentive they've ever created. And they did it both for residential and the commercial and you're reading that correctly, that is not a typo, $3,500. And the reason that it's $3,500 compared to, well, at the time, $700 GMP um, was because 100% of Burlington Electric's energy comes from uh, renewable sources. And these incentives are, are based on, uh, are, it's a calculation based on greenhouse gas emission reductions. So that's why. And then I went up to the Vermont Electric Co-op uh, meeting uh, a couple of years ago right around this time a year, um, parked my mower. They were promoting their incentives for cars, EVs, introduced myself to a bunch of the board members, showed them the mower. A month later, two months later, they created their own incentive. Um, did the same thing with Washington Electric. Um, uh, there you see theirs is a thousand and same with uh, Vermont Electric. Um, and then I went to the, I didn't even know who these people were, but uh, the Vermont Public Power Supply Authority, which represents uh, 12 um, uh, member utilities up in um, Northeast Kingdom. Um, and uh, so that's that. Any questions so far? No questions? Okay. So, um, one of the things that struck me when I first became this Northeast rep for Mean Green, I just, I came into it with, as I could go into most, most things with um, a certain amount of uh, unrestrained optimism, <laughs> pathological, I guess, naivete, whatever. Um, I thought this would be really easy. This is Vermont, but I really wasn't that tuned into the mowing industry, the lawn care industry in terms of how much mowers cost. And, 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 it, and it immediately I started to realize that this was gonna be a lot harder to do than I had thought. And um, so these are the reasons, <laughs> um, you know, bias and skepticism, you know, uh, you can just, I, won't, I don't need to go through this. There was just a lot of reasons. Um, uh, including people don't really know, even among people, I was surprised, even people who are supportive of, are aware of, take climate change seriously and are trying to do things in their own life. It, it, 
it just the, the there was sort of a, a blind they were the idea of lawn care just didn't seem to be that important um that's changing fortunately people like sally calling me and saying hey let's talk about this um then there's institutional barriers um big big you know the fact that these mowers cost 25 percent to 300 percent more than a conventional mower that's that's a big lift um you know even though the lower the operating costs are so much lower and it's a little even harder here in the northeast because the operating the savings in operating costs are based on the number of hours the mower is running and if you're only mowing and for half the year or less than half the year then you're only getting half the operational savings as you would if you lived in a climate where you're mowing 75 percent of the year or maybe even 100 percent of the year down in florida so that's an issue um the the incentives are nice but you know, $2,500 off a $24,000 machine. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's tough, um, but people are doing it. And, um, and then, and I've actually, I, because of that, I went to um, VSCCU and asked them if they'd create a low interest loan program, which they did, which helps a little bit. Um, I've actually made um, a suggestion to the legislature, uh, people at the climate uh, council, um, that they consider doing a reduced sales tax to make it basically revenue neutral. Um, we'll see where that goes. Um, but that would help also to cut those sales tax to, let's say, you know, 3%, 4% instead of 6%. They'd still get the same amount of tax revenue, um, but it would save the customers some money. Um, no incentives offered to efficiency Vermont VIC, but that's because their mandate said they, up until now they can't do fuel switching. So, um, um, and then I have a document um, that I've written um, that gives some very specific suggestions of how to overcome these cultural and institutional barriers. And I'm not gonna go through that now, but I'm happy to send it to folks afterwards. Um, uh, and then this taking action is another document that I produced that has some, you know, some just some ideas on for energy committees, for example, to how to approach a town and to start this conversation, collect data that, that's useful. Um, and um, yeah, and then go. So I think that's it. Yeah. Um Steve, uh, there's a question that came up in the chat. May I ask that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the few people I know, neighbors, who had electric mowers, got rid of them because they truly were not as powerful, didn't hold a charge, made a sloppy cut. I hear you saying they've improved. Is there a place where they can be demoed or borrowed to try? Um. So I was trying to get out of this screen share. You can, you can uh, disable my screen share. It'd probably be the easiest way to do that. Um, so um, it, you know, I guess the question would be, um, you know, it'd be good to have some more information. Are we talking about these push mowers? Or are we talking about um, the riding mowers? Um, uh, maybe it was a Newton. Um, you know, from what I've heard, uh, these, the residential mowers um, are, are, the mowers that are available now are really powerful. And um, uh, the hardware stores that sell steel now have them, um, whether they have one that can be demoed or not, I don't know. Um, I used to do a, a lot of demos with my, um, my commercial mower, um, I do have a steel, um, you know, so anybody would be welcome to come, come check it out. But I think Sally, this is one of the suggestions I had for you is the role the energy committee could play is to uh, find out who has them in your community and see if that usually they'd be willing, people want to share this information. And so, um, 
So, you know, to set up kind of a, a, a local community um, demo, and it, it doesn't even have to be a certain day. You can just link people up together. And so they introduce themselves and then they set it up themselves to come over and check it out sometime. Um, or just even to talk to them, to hear, you know, so. But I've heard I great things about idea. these mowers. Um, I used a mower, I used a Newton for 10 years at the house I lived in over on Pine Street. The owner of the house was away for, you know, eight to 10 years. And I lived there and used her Newton and and loved it. Now it was a small yard, but it cut the grass and uh, it was quiet and no exhaust. And I think I bought one new blade and that was the entire amount of maintenance over 10 years. <laughs> it's yeah, just like so, amazing. So that's important though, in terms of maintenance, um, you know, keeping blade sharp, keeping the deck clean, um, you know, cleaning out under, underneath the deck after each mow so that the grass doesn't collect and, and dry because that's going to impede the performance of the mower. Um, so there's things that can be done to, uh, but you're right. There is no, <laughs> that is, that's the only maintenance is keeping the, the, the mowing deck clean and, and sharp, keeping the, you know, sharpening the blades once a year or twice a year, depending on how much you're using it. Um, uh, so, and getting back to this sample, I do have a steel. My son used it. He started an electric mowing business this summer um, using my mean green. And then we bought a, a set of the steel equipment, um, the push mower and uh, the string trimmer. And he used it and, you know, it was fine, you know, mowing really tall grass. So, um, yeah, anyway. And I'm happy to let someone come up and try it sometime because I have it here. I'm not giving, I'm not getting rid of it. Well, I think it's a great idea to have an opportunity for people to test use them because you yeah, really don't know unless, unless you felt it. And, you know, so that, that would be a great idea. Porter, thanks for bringing that up. And thank you for offering to have people test drive your steel. Um, so uh, any more questions about uh, electric mowers at this point? Jay, do you want to um, say anything about your experience? Being a, you know, being a contractor for, for being a person who mows a million lawns with uh, one of these mowers. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. And uh, first, I just want to make a quick point to uh, Porter's question. Um, yeah. As far as the residential push mowers go, it's it's very similar to the gas mowers that are out there, and that you you get what you pay for. Um, there are a lot of really low priced electric mowers out there. And even when you get into the higher priced units, you're also looking at a, at a great balancing act, you know, you, and you have to kind of identify what characteristics are important to you. You know, I don't say I only like to mow my lawn every two weeks. So you might be looking then at a mower that's more powerful, but as a result, it might have less runtime. Or you might want a bigger cutting deck, or you might want self-propelled and all of those things, you know, will decrease the battery life. Um, that said, you can also get into the machines like the steel that Stephen mentioned, um, and that, that's pretty darn close to a commercial machine, and that's going to suit anyone's needs, but it's definitely going to cost more than, you know, a lower end unit at Home Depot, but uh, it is going to do the job. So um, that's why it would be so important to offer some demos around here, you know, get people trying them out, seeing how they feel, and really, again, just getting a good solid understanding of what characteristics in the mower are most important to them. Um, as far as my experience, you know, this is all I've known. You know, I've, I've mowed a lot of grass throughout my life, but I was never in the commercial mowing business prior to the electric mowers. So it's really all I know. And, um, you know, I, I'll admit there's definitely been some downsides to it. Even my commercial machine, if I get into a foot tall, really wet grass, it's going to struggle, but it will go through it. But as far as 98% of the properties and conditions I mow in, it, it's just amazing. Um, the cut quality is comparable to a commercial gas mower. And at the same time, I'm not listening to the, to the noise all day or breathing in the fumes or dealing with gas or any of those things. I, 
simply go mow all day and I get home and I plug my mower into the charger right on the trailer and it's good to go for another seven hours the next day. So it, it's just, it's a great way of life. And the way I got into it, it's going through struggles with my old gas mower on my own property, just not starting mixing gas and smoking. And so uh, it, it was a great jump. There's so many less headaches to go with the electric mowing. The maintenance is a lot less. The operating costs are a lot less. The, obviously the CO2 emissions are a lot less and the, just the, the amount of nasty fumes you're breathing is a lot less on your body as well. Anyone have any more questions for? That's Jay? great. Uh, I just wanted to add about just um, follow up on on Jay's comment about the different qualities of these mowers. It is very true. You get what you pay for. And what I found with the steel, for example, they have a lot of different options in terms of like uh, battery capacity. And I've just learned from using um, like battery powered um, tools that. Um, whatever the biggest one that's available is going to be, you know, the one to go for and just spend a little extra money. And the thing about the steel, the, the set that we got, um, the battery, it's, um, it's the higher end battery and it can be used in the mower In the mower can, you, you can actually put two in there. So if you need extra runtime, uh, but that same battery is used for all the other tools too, like the string trimmer and the um, chainsaw um, and um, the, um, I bought a pole pruner and they all just work on the same battery, one charger. Um, and these batteries, I was amazed at how fast, like these batteries charge, I'm used to charging, you know, cars and uh, you know, even with a level two, you're looking at four or five hours probably, you know, of course, it's a car versus <laughs> a string trimmer, but um, you know, 15 minutes batteries charge. Now I got another 45 minutes hour of, of charge time on a, on a, with a chainsaw. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, but as Jay mentioned, you know, the steel is is a bit pricier than the other equipment out there. But I, I've talked to a number of people who have the ego, and and they're happy with it. And um, what I had this idea this crazy idea that maybe I'll follow through, but of being able to setting up this like open source um, review website for electric lawn care equipment, it would have to be moderated, but you know, real people talking about their actual experience with these products, not people that are getting paid to, you know, push a particular product, which I think the army guy might be, but he's still, you know, reviewing a lot of different ones. Um, but again, having, we have front porch forum, you know, it'd be a, a way, it, 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 there, there would be a way for people to share this information. I'd love to see it happen. I'd love to be part of it. Um, you know, I have a few different tools now, but I'd be happy to get some more, but anyway, so. Yeah. Sounds great. Hi, uh, Trump. I, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, the, the points you made about weighing out all the trade-offs. Um, my mom uh, currently, uh, my dad passed away and my mom is now home alone. And my dad was like, Mr. Lawn guy, <laughs> like mm -hmm. golf course, two acres up in Fairfield. And, um, you know, she never really, you know, participated much of that, but it was really important to her. Um, she didn't want to mow the whole two acres, but she wanted to have some ownership of taking care of the property that she's still going to live in. And my brother and I made the decision with her that the way she could do that was to go to an electric handheld trimmer. So she could just do around her flower beds and the mm -hmm. house and, you know, the simple stuff away from the road that gave her the, you know, the ownership to still be able to do it, but wasn't because we didn't want her much like we don't really want her burning wood anymore. Like we're trying to eliminate obstacles to her independence as she gets older, but still allowing her to have that. So I think about the power of the ease when like, there's things I'm not even thinking about. Like I came to this meeting for the, for the environmental reasons, but then you said not pulling on your cord five times. And I'm thinking about going out to my snowblower and wrestling with it in, in these winter days. And, um, 
wow, that's all those are kind of really nice trade offs at, at some yeah. point um, that, that you think about what really is your priority and, and where do you want to go. But to echo that, um, I think you really do have to feel and touch something because the balance, how it feels in your hand, you know, especially these trim things where the battery is placed. There, there's so many little nuances between some of the, the companies, mm. um, you know, that just feeling how things feel and where things are, I think is, is important to, when you're going to make an investment like that. So I would definitely recommend trying to lay hands on something um, as much as you can. Jay, I'm curious what, um, thanks Troy. That's you. Good. Jay, what, what uh, tools, hand tools are you using? Well, I started out with the Mean Green equipment. Right. Well, back when I started six years ago, they also made a uh, they made a backpack blower and a trimmer. Um, so I started with those. the The trimmer has a really large. Well, it's not really large, but it, the battery does require you to wear a backpack to carry it around. And it weighs about twelve pounds, so it's not that bad. And the machine was great, and it, it has quite a lot of power. And I still use that same machine mm -hmm. today. Wow. And then, uh, so this was back. This was the first ever commercial grade string trimmer. So back then, six years ago, the cost was about fifteen hundred dollars for it. And I've been using it religiously for five years. It's never let me down. And then this year, I wanted a, a backup, so I went to uh, Taylor Rental in Middlebury here, and I got a Greenworks handheld trimmer. Mm. And I ended up getting a great deal, and I can't remember what I paid for it, because I bought a bunch of other things too, a chainsaw and a, and a pole trimmer and, and things like that. But I, I would say with a battery, it was probably around $300 or so. And mm. that $300 machine right this year, and well, last year in 2020, is just as good as the $1,500 machine I bought five years ago. I, w I was really shocked by the, the performance and the power and the balance of it, you know, because I'm doing it commercially, I have multiple batteries, but uh, even still for a, a homeowner to have one, one battery would take care of all their needs. So I guess my point is the consumer grade equipment these days just keeps getting better and better and better. And the prices are finally starting to come down a little bit as well. Yeah, and I, I just want to add to this uh, comment that Troy made about, um, you know, the ease of, when we think about, I mean, in 10 years, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people are going it, to, it's going to be the, it's going to be the exception that people are going to still be using electric, I mean, uh, gas powered um, string trimmers, and maybe even mowers, just because it seems like it's such a um, <laughs> drag. Uh, an old technology. What was that? Drag? That's a drag. I mean, you think about, just think about this internal combustion engine. It was a great invention for its time, but it's, you know, compared to the electric motor, which I don't know if any of you know this. I just found this out. The town of, um, town in, in Addison County um, begins with a B, not Barton, Bristol, no. Um, on, 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 on Route 7, um, uh, they just did a major repair on the road. What town is that? Brandon. Brandon. Brandon was the, it was the, where the electric motor was invented. Hmm. Wow. They were going to, they were going to do this year, last summer, they were supposed to do, or maybe it was this summer. I think it was this summer. They were supposed to do, a, it was like the hundredth anniversary. The guy that invented the electric motor um, was f in Brandon. And so they had this whole thing. They were going to have electric vehicles and it was going to have this big celebration to honor um, this former Brandon resident uh, who had <laughs> an electric mower, motor. But I just thought, that, what's that? I just said, that's great. I, I thought you were done. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, but go ahead. It, I think that's, that's where things are moving. And uh the idea of using, for me, like using a, a, you know, I don't do a lot of chainsawing, but the little bit that I do, I was so glad to finally get rid of my gas chainsaw because it just, it's just such a pleasure to use an electric chainsaw compared to, and that's true with mowers. I, I, I was on a 
Kubota mower, diesel mower for many years before I got my mean green mower. And it's just a whole different experience. Uh, am I, am I, I allowed like to that. ask You're a question? I'm here, absolutely I'm here to present. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, Jay, you've, you've had commercial, it sounds like the mean green machines for a long time. Have, what is, have you replaced a battery yet on any of those machines? Or, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. And just like, do you anticipate that you will change the battery before you swap out the whole machine or what, like, how do you think about that as a sort of consumable. Yeah, when I purchase a machine, and I, I think they still say this now, is that the uh, batteries are good for an average of about 8,000 hours. Is that correct, Stephen? So it's 1,500 full charge cycles. So, um, and then, and even then, it's only lost 10% of its capacity. Yeah. So 1,500, 1, what's that? 1,500. Full charge cycles. So if you're getting six, five hours off of a full charge, five times or six, you know, times 1500. So that's where the eight to 9,000 hours or more comes into play. So these batteries are gonna last um, for a very, you know, the mowers and the batteries themselves, the mowers are built really strong too. So, you know, they're just gonna go and go and go. See most, again, it's such a different paradigm most people that run conventional internal, internal combustion engine motor, mowers have to change those out every three, four, five, six years because they, everything starts, there's so many things that can go wrong with them. Fuel systems, cooling systems, you know, drive systems, you know, not so hmm. many things. And so these mowers are gonna, if you try and find a used um, mean green mower, you, 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 it's, it's almost impossible because people just hang on to them because they just go and go and go. So it's a good question though. And, and those, those um, batteries are very expensive. Those are, you know, those batteries, that battery and one of Jay's batteries, it's a $3,500 battery. Um, so, and that price is probably going to be coming down over time. Um, thanks to Elon Musk. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it, they are pricey, so, but they just, they're gonna keep going. I gotta go in uh, three minutes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. Appreciate You're it. Welcome. Jay, did you have anything more you wanted to add to that? No, I, I just wanted to add that, you know, basically by the time the lifespan of the battery is up, the mower is gonna be ready to retire anyway, you know, although there's not a lot of moving parts on it or things to go wrong, you know, things, Things that you're using on a daily commercial basis are just going to wear out after seven, eight, nine years. So, uh, you know, luckily for me, the batteries just aren't a concern that I have to worry about. Well, I, I will just add to that. The things that the other moving part besides the wheels are the electric motors. And those motors can be replaced like the, the blade motor is like for $350. Yeah, they're not even that much. Yeah, they're even right. Much. They're two, two something. And then, and and you can replace it yourself. So easy. The drive motors are a little bigger, a little more complicated. But I've I've seen them replaced. They're not that big a deal. You just pull the motor off or the wheel off, and you know you jack up the 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 back end and and a couple bolts, and you take it out, unplug it. <laughs> it's like there you go. And even so, the drive motors may be more like four hundred dollars. Um, but those are going to just keep going and going and going. So the whole, theoretically, you could replace all three blade motors and the two drive motors for probably under, what is that, uh, six, um, I don't know, under $1,500 probably. <laughs> you cut, there you go, it, it, if you even need to replace them. So these mowers are going to be around for a long, long time. Anyway, real pleasure uh, doing this. Um, happy yeah. to do it again. Thank you so much. Um, Happy to take questions later, send that, you know, that document that I mentioned. Uh, but Jay, great seeing you. Congratulations like that, on your going into what, your seventh year and- Going into six. Six. Yeah. Great. Well, we're pretty soon we're gonna hear from two guys who are gonna be uh, 
talking about generating the electricity for those. There cars. you go. Uh, and I may be investing in that's the project in Bristol. Uh, I was curious about it. So if that's the community yeah, yeah. project. Anyway, thank you so much. That's a different one. Uh, that's a different one, but yeah. You're uh, welcome. Have a good night. So long. So long, everybody. Thanks. Yep. All right. Um, well, that was great to have a little, definitely have a good blast of uh, learning about electric mowers. Um, does anyone have any other questions for Jay or anything else they want to say about electric mowing right now? All right. Um, I'll say one thing, and that is I heard that Richard Butts here in Bristol got some sort of an electric mower that also um, is kind of a high end um, residential machine that also blows snow too. Snow blower, um, lawnmower, and some other thing too. I'm not sure what the other thing is. I don't think it, maybe it's a leaf blower or two. I don't really know, but. Barber. And I think the, the it starts with, what is it? I, I was making a joke that maybe it's also oh. a barber. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, Jay, is there anything more you wanted to share about, uh, like, like what's it like to get into the lawn mowing, lawn, lawn mowing business? I mean, do you do you want to share anything with, um, like, well, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's something I've really enjoyed, and I kind of fell into it by accident years ago when I couldn't get my gas machine started. So I started looking for an electric mower for my household, which is how I stumbled upon the commercial grade electric mowers, and I didn't even know they existed. At the time, I was just in a job I had been in for nine years and was ready to make a change. So I thought, wow, that could be a really good business model around here. So. I took the leap and it's worked out well. And, you know, it, it's clearly the wave of the future. Um, the technology just keeps improving and the prices are coming down. So that's a great thing. And, you know, you, you look at uh, very environmentally friendly states like um, California, they have, they've banned electric or gas powered leaf blowers. You're not even allowed to use those anymore. The commercial guys. And, you know, it's only a matter of time before they ban the gas mowers too. So, um, yeah, it's just a great way to operate. The technology is advanced to the point where they're comparable with gas machines. So there, there's really just no reason not to make the leap right now, whether you're a commercial operator or just looking for a better way to run your household. Great. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. Sure. All right. So, um, Troy, how about you? Do you feel uh, satisfied with the lawn mowing conversation and ready to go into solar? <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, the, the commercial and the homeowner side are, are so, so different because, um, you know, I can mow half my lawn and call it a day and mow the other half of my lawn when I get to it, whereas Jay's got to mow all day. So his his needs are, are far different than mine. And, and I, yeah, so I think that with just adjusting how we think about what we do and how and when we do it allows all of this to be possible. It's just um just we, we get used to the technology we have in our hand so if we if we all of a sudden didn't have any gas lawnmowers we would just figure out how to mow our lawns for the charge we had or share them or like it just you know we we do what we do based on we're creatures of, of our comfort and habit so but i'd love to hear some of the stuff about solar yeah absolutely great um all right so um, Nathaniel and Chris, um, you can share your updates with the uh, array uh, that you're working on over so you we, know, the, the Lathrop Plateau in Bristol off of South Street is what we're talking about. And we, we did a presentation to the Town Planning Commission last night. So we have everything in a, in a PowerPoint that we could run through really quickly, if you would give me sharing 
Yes. Uh, Troy, did you want to ask something? Well, sorry, I have a quick question. Am I now in an, are you guys in an official meeting that I'm not supposed to be in or shouldn't be in? I don't or? know. This is totally open for the public. We're oh, okay. so, I just wanted we're to make so sure. glad you're here. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Just this to make is, sure. <laughs> I was hoping more people would show up and want to talk about sharing electric mowers in town and how we could do that, but that'll yeah. be another meeting, I think. Um, but the, uh, the two second. things, the, um, okay, let me try. Okay, cool. I just set you up to be able to share your screen. Okay. Good. Um, can you see it? Yep. Great. Um, so why don't, why don't we just r run through it? And it, it is, a, um, pretty detailed and we have covered quite a bit of this information in the past, but um, I, I think it's just worth going through so the, um, as many people as possible can, can see this as, as we move through. So um, with, with that, Nathaniel, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you and, and try to stay ahead of you as, as we move through the slides. Cool. Yeah. Um, Feel free to interrupt me or raise your hand or whatever um, if you have questions along the way. So anyway, just short intro, um, Green Peak Solar is a uh, Vermont owned and based. Chris and I are the principals. Um, we're a renewable energy developer. Uh, we are also working on battery energy storage uh, projects for the last couple of years. We mo work mostly with utilities directly, towns and school districts. We tend to develop projects on the larger size um, which are more of a wholesale generator versus a net metering project. And um, in doing so, we've developed some of the lowest cost um, solar projects for Vermont ratepayers. Um, so here's a map of where the project is located. Basically, you know, the, in the center of the map where it says Bristol, that's the intersection right by the town offices. The project is located on a plateau. Um, basically, if you get on South Street and cross the New Haven, uh, Cane Hill Road is kind of right across the road. It goes up to the top of this hill and it's about a 20 acre field um, where the project is located. That's kind of, kind of, kind of tucked away. We've got some photos we'll show you in the next couple of slides. Um, so there's a photo looking basically from Main Street, just east of, east of town, looking across where the pump house is. The plateau is kind of on the other side of the river where the arrows are pointing to. Um, so we feel like this is a pretty good location from an aesthetics perspective because there's the, uh, you know, this is obviously leaf off conditions, um, with snow on the ground. So it's really going to be your most impactful, um, view shed. And it's even still, it's pretty, um, you know, it's, it's relatively screened, um, from a screening perspective. And then the last one is, uh, from the creamy stand. So again, quite a lot of natural screening for this project which is one of the most important attributes um, that we look for when we're looking for these projects. So project outreach, just a little bit of background. You know, we uh, started talking with the landowners about a year ago. Um, at the same time, we recognized the town was going through an enhanced um, energy plan process. Um, and there was some, we had some questions about um, this preferred site designation this project is not net metering. So there is in net metering, the preferred site designation refers to a different rate class. We're, we're, we're selling directly to the utilities. So that's not um, necessarily pertinent to, pertinent to us, but we basically reached out to the town to see if there were any red flags with the project being you know, in its location outside of what the town had was in the process of designating preferred areas. And at that time, the feedback we got was that, you know, um, that that projects aren't prohibited, that the planning process wasn't really dedicated towards identifying certain specific parcels of land. And it seemed like based on the feedback we received that, um, you know, that we decided to, to pursue the project a little further. So throughout the summer, we spent um, time securing the contracts for to sell the power, working with the utilities. Um, we bid the, bid the project into an RFP and we we're the lowest priced bidder. Um, and then we really started our outreach again um, this fall. We've, um, we've reached out to the, um, all the abutting property owners um, next to the site. We've reached out to the town on a number of occasions. Have, um, and recently we've, we've provided a 45 day notice, which is a packet of 
piece of information discussing the project and you know our intent to file a petition for a permit with the certificate with the Public Utility Commission. So benefits to Bristol, um, you guys have a super um, really great uh, town plan. You're, you're, you're adopting the 90 by 50 goals, which is basically 90% of the total energy um, in 2050 uh, to come from renewable resources, which is a really awesome, um, really awesome goal. What that translates into is about 7,600 megawatt hours of electricity from renewables by 2025 and 16,000 megawatt hours of renewable energy by 2050. Um, based on some publicly available data, my estimate and what you guys were having the town plan is I think it was, um, you're at around 3,600 megawatt hours today. So the addition of this project will add about 4,500 megawatt hours, which after, um, after its first year of, you know, after development and operations, you guys will be right on track to meet your 2025 goals, um, with the addition of this project. Um, and we'll talk about the st structure of the project a little bit, but, uh, other benefits, um, last time I think Sally, we had quoted, it was 11,000 in property taxes. That's just the municipal portion. There's an additional 8,000 that would go towards the education fund. I don't know if you guys all notice on your tax bill, there's your municipal bill and then there's the education fund. So we just wanted to give the total number. We're also proposing an energy storage project um, right next to the battery to basically um, leverage some of the shared infrastructure. It's a really great place on the grid to have energy storage and it would help to add reliability. Um, and really that's, that's consistent with the draft town plan which talks about, you know, if larger projects are done, that there should really be a component of battery energy storage. And that's been something we've been working on, um, some standalone battery energy storage projects in Vermont, which we're really excited about as well. Again, we talked about the preferred location piece. Um, uh, again, it's not um, it's preferred, but it's not prohibited in this location. Um, we also feel like this site is really consistent with a lot of the other um, proposed siting criteria in the town. Um, and we could talk about that in a second when we get to the site plan. Um, lastly, we're, we talked about this with the planning commission specifically last night is that um, one thing towns are often really interested in is, is um, visual screening. Because, you know, as you can see from these projects, there's pretty significant natural screening. We haven't proposed any screening for this project, but one request which the planning commission asked was that, you know, could we basically revisit um, screening after the project is built in the event that, um, you know, there's some areas that we didn't anticipate, can we add some screening later on? And so just like really any, any other comments that folks have, we really want this to be a collaborative process where we think that's a great idea. Um, we're going to basically in our certificate of good, good filing, we're going to, make that commitment to, um, to work with the town of Bristol um, to do that site visit. Um, and really we're open to you know, feedback on, on anything else. And then one of the other things that's come up um, that we talked about was, sounds like there's some recreational use of this property, at least as a kind of gateway to, um, to some of the wooded areas further east. Uh, so we're, we're trying to make sure that the fence is designed or we are going to make sure the fence is designed so that it's set back from the perimeter of the field so that folks can, you know, still access uh, the surrounding land um, via this parcel. So, um, so this project is not a net metering project. And what that means is it's more akin to a wholesale project. We'll actually sell all the power and the environmental attributes, the RECs, to Vermont Utilities. So that was um, that process came out of what's called the standard offer program, which is an annual RFP run by the state to basically give out power purchase agreements to the lowest price projects. And this one was actually the lowest priced bid in 2020 RFP. And so we're, we'd be selling power at just under um, nine cents kilowatt hour, which is pretty close to half of what the current net metering credit is. Um, so we, we really feel like um, these projects are a great way to demonstrate um, a mixture of renewables that are not only 
um, you know, at folks' residences, but also, um, you know, just really low cost that helps to bring down the cost of renewables to all rate payers. Um, so this is not a project where it's community members have to subscribe, but everybody as a Vermont rate payer, you know, will be basically, this project will be added into your fuel mix as a renewable generator, and it'll help to, to, um, to keep your energy prices low and hopefully actually reduce energy prices over time. Um, we already talked a little bit about the battery, but basically battery is a, um, it's relatively straightforward use case. As we see more and more solar coming on, we, um, we're also seeing peaks shift away from the daytime hours when the solar is producing. Um, so having a battery at this location really add, adds the ability to use that battery to target peak hours as they shift away from daytime. Um, and that also helps with reliability, reduces transmission charges, you know, as we see electrification of mowers, EVs, heat pumps, you know, we're expecting load to grow. And by having a battery that helps to keep those peaks low, we really are trying to save and defer transmission and distribution system um, investments. So we're really excited about the battery project as well. Um, lastly, we also are considering opportunities for dual use agriculture, um, pollinator, planting pollinator friendly seeds. Currently the the field is in corn. Um, and so, you know, we feel like reclaiming it, planting it with pollinator friendly seeds um, is a, will be a great start. Um, and then we're also really open to, um, to other ideas around, um, you know, grazing practices with sheep um, kind of et cetera. So we, we're, we're, pretty, we're pretty interested in the dual use opportunity. And then uh, certainly we only mow it once a year, Jay. So I don't know if, uh, it gets pretty long. Usually they're brush hogs more than mowing, but I love the idea of, um, yeah, not having a, a, a gas powered mower out here. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, so this is the site plan. Um, as you can see, we're, we're taking up pretty much most of the 20 acre field. Um, the battery energy storage is located um, in the top left. We'd be accessing the project, both projects off of Cane Hill Road. So using the existing road off of South Street. So no new driveway, no new curb cuts off of the existing road. Um, there'd be some traffic during construction, obviously, but afterwards, really quite minimal. These projects are monitored remotely 24 seven. Really it's maybe once a quarter, somebody goes out and does preventative maintenance or you know, you roll a truck to go uh, check a fuse that, that the alarm, you know, some preventative maintenance like that. Um, so quite low traffic. Other great attributes of the site, we already talked about the visibility and you know, really trying to reduce glare, sound to any um, nearby residences. Uh, we've done all of our environmental studies, had consultations with um, the Agency of Natural Resources. There's no wetlands, we're out of the floodplain, we're out of the river corridors. Really from an environmental perspective, the site doesn't have a lot of impacts. Um, no necessary wildlife habitat. And then um, for the agricultural soils, um, we're gonna be committing um, to the uh, Agency of Agriculture's um, requirements to basically stockpile all prime ag soils on the site and then reclaim them um, based on soil horizon when the project is done. And the project will have a decommissioning letter of credit that's required from the Public Utility Commission so that that basically secures our commitment to that reclamation. So if something were to happen and the project were stopped making money, it's not, and Chris and I are all gone or whatever, there's money that's at the Public Utility Commission to secure to make sure that this project will be decommissioned and the uh, land can be returned to, um, to what, it, what it's used for today. Lastly, we're proposing, a, it's not that unique anymore, but somewhat novel, um, for Vermont anyway, technology that's called a single axis tracker. So it, it looked relatively similar to a fixed tilt system that you might see um, regularly, but with the exception that the rows tilt east to west um, throughout the day. Um, and so what you can see here, this is, a, this is an example 2.2 .2 megawatt project that's a single axis tracker. The inverter is in the middle, and then each of these rows rotates east to west. And then down in the lower right, you can see um, this is what they look like up close and they, they rotate around the torque tube where the red arrows are. 
so and by using the single axis tracker um we're for us it's the the most cost effective way to get the most electricity production out of the land use um, so our goal is always to try to increase our energy density and you know we we recognize the importance of 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 land in Vermont. And so we really try to do our best to make sure we're going to squeeze as much energy out of it as we can. So that, that's, um, that's it, Sally. That was the, that was the we, gave me, we gave you the full, full presentation. Yeah, we did. <laughs> I'm sure there's new, new folks on the line. So awesome. Eventually you'll get sick of us. And, no, no. and I, that's great. I learn more every time. And, and Sally, I know that you um, and your committee was really interested in learning specifically around the benefits to Bristol because the, um, the energy is going to all Vermonters. Yeah. We, we spent uh, a little bit more time learning more about the Bristol specific 90 by 50 goals. Um, so, I mean, it, it, to the extent that you ha you guys have questions about this slide specifically, um, happy to go into more detail um, as needed. I can I ask a couple questions. Sure, uh, I'm not. A, I tell me if I'm out of bounds because I'm not on the energy committee or on any <laughs> town committees. So I just speak as a interested resident and, and taxpayer. Um, but I know that we've talked about at the rec club, um, solar power, you know, we can't really put it on our property. We thought about putting it up on the uh, grandstand on the roof, which is probably something much smaller than what, what you guys do, but we are trying to figure out a way to sort of make our property. We don't use a lot of electricity and we're a nonprofit. You know, we really just exist for the benefit of the community. So we're just trying to figure out how to make ourselves almost net zero, right? If we put, you know, 20 solar squares on top of the grandstand and fed it into the, into the meter or the net, wherever, in essence, could we almost be, you know, net zero. But the other thing we've talked about, and I'm sure the energy committee has talked about this, is we really should have some charging stations for cars totally. around town. You know, we're a, we're a big tourist town uh quite a bit of the year and a lot of people come through especially in the fall come through for weddings and as more and more people come in with um, electric cars and um don't have the infrastructure like a resident would have you know how do we get some either at the rec club so they while they're playing tennis or doing something on the grounds or at the park um you know how do we how do we potentially take a project like this and you know, could we potentially ask the town to earmark those property taxes mm. for chargers for cars? You know, could that be, I don't know how I'm, that works. I am so glad you're here asking these questions, Troy. Um, yeah. We've we've tried to get um, chargers in town for the past three years and um, for different reasons, it's fallen through. We're gonna try again. But the idea that you're bringing up is maybe you want a charger over there near the Bristol uh, rec area or something. Yeah, that, yeah. That's another great look. That's a great idea. Um, so I'm definitely going to be thinking of how we can do that. And, um, and I, and I like your idea of some of the taxes going into that. That sounds great. That might be a way to do the money thing for the town. We're also going to talk to GMP and see what their latest uh, incentives are and see what they can do. And I'm working with the SEAC, which is the Climate Economy Action Center. And we're hoping to get another round of some good deal on chargers for towns in Addison County. So that's, a, that's another project that's coming up. So it would be great to stay in touch with you to see, you know, if if Bristol Rec wants to be a part of that, you know, especially yeah. if you're going to get an electric mower. <laughs> yeah. Well, just, I just think about all these things, you know, like um, you guys, Green Mountain Solar, have you done any of those projects where they literally build over the parking lots, the, the giant, the, like, I guess they're carports is what I would call them. Yeah. The yeah. elevated, elevated um, solar field, like our high school parking lot is sitting in the sun 
12 hours a day. <laughs> so I've, I've actually gone to a couple of meetings at the, with the school board. Is it all the news? The yes. Superintendent? Yeah. We met with him. Um, a couple of years ago, the standard offer program that we've been into had a specific carve out, which is unfortunately they don't, they're not continuing it, but for, um, for carports as kind of a pilot project, mm -hmm. the issue with a carport is it's a lot more expensive um, to design and install yeah. than a project like this because you're elevated, you know, up 10, 11 feet. So you're going to catch a lot more wind. You have to mm. be, pressures have to be stronger in case somebody bumps into them with their car. But anyway, the state had a program, which I thought was fantastic to, to look at carports. We actually, we had some discussion with, um, with the school district about it at that time. But um, unfortunately it was just, there wasn't enough time to be able to get it done to bid the RFP. In yeah. one way, it's um, the, the kind of opportunity to do that is not there, but I totally agree. It seemed like a fantastic spot and, you know, something we don't typically develop projects at the scale that you're talking about. But if, um, if there's things we can do to help with the rec club in terms of like giving you an indicative, like we have some software that we use to size a system, show you what it would look like, give you kind of general size of the array, happy to help out with that stuff. I mean, if we can contribute to the community in other ways that help more people go renewable, I think that's, that's our goal. Um, so yeah, that, I think we'd be, if we can help with that, we'd be happy to. Oh, um, and then certainly the EV chargers, I, I find that to be a really, I live over in Waitsfield and um, I'm, I'm always wishing, you know, we had more. It's uh, it's pretty remarkable that, um, you know, that neither of the supermarkets in town have a yeah. um, <laughs> an EV charger in front of them. Yeah. And that's kind of a bummer. Um. So two, a couple more things too about that is, um, do you know the charger that's in Middlebury by the river, be, kind of by American Flatbread? I don't know if you've seen that, but it's a timber frame, a beautiful timber frame, uh, you know, awning like thing that Will Gusikoff built with solar panels on it. And there are a couple of chargers under there. It's beautiful. And he is willing to do those, build those. That's one idea. Another, here's, here's another way you can probably get inexpensive solar. And that is Acorn Energy Co-op is going to put an array, a 500 kilowatt array on the dump, the old landfill. Mm -hmm. And you can buy into that at probably less than what it would cost you to put it on your roof or build your own. Oh. So, so, and we've got your name down. It's already on a spreadsheet <laughs> to... Um, we're going to talk to all the nonprofits in town and all the residents and all the churches and businesses to see who wants to subscribe because it's, uh, we just don't have the, I haven't got the paperwork from them yet. It's not quite ready, but yeah, hopefully within a month we'll be, you know, sending everyone in Bristol an opportunity to sign on to that because Bristol residents will get first dibs as well as, um, nonprofits and that kind of thing. Wow. Great. Awesome. Yeah. I look forward to, to hearing about that. Great. Yeah. It's, you know, back to the, the car chargers, you know, my high school, I teach up at CVU and we put in like two, when we did something, all of a sudden just two of those plunked in. And I literally think it was two kids or three kids from the energy committee of the school, the, you know, the environmental action club, Oh yeah. literally like beat on the doors of Green Mountain Power or somebody and like got them put in. I don't know how they That's did it, great. but kids can work magic because nobody likes to say no to a 16 year old trying to That's save the planet. Yeah. That's great. I think we should talk to the, um, yeah, the uh, environmental Inact. action group at yeah. Mount Abe and Mount see Abe. if they would, yeah, see if they can go to GMP. It's true. They, they'll get much more. <laughs> so traction yeah more action yeah that's can great I, can i ask one more question just on the educator side of because i'm an educator for for the yeah for green peak solar guys um is there a way to incorporate um and i know it wouldn't be your job but is there a way to figure out how to incorporate an educational aspect of this project to be sort of ongoing um 
so that the kids at Mount Abe or at the elementary schools could come down and like we, see the grid and understand the grid. Maybe the maybe the meter could uh, through a computer system be pumped right into the science class at school so or the engineering class so they can literally like do work on you know crunching the numbers understanding these things sure um so we we did a, a remote net metered project actually on premises for the williamstown williamstown school district um and there we we put up a kiosk um not, not, nothing too fancy it's that's you know it's wooden has a small roof on it but it just has all the information about mm -hmm. the project um in terms of the 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 like p piping information to the school i mean i i would certainly be happy to come talk to people and kids if they're interested and sort of give them a little bit more science-based presentation around what it is that we're doing, um, especially around the, the, the battery side and the, um, the, the peak shifting that, and, and, and peak shaving that it will be doing should, should be pretty interesting to, to be. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if, if anybody in Vermont is, is following what's going on in Texas, but I mm -hmm. just, I just, I'm getting phone calls from people who've never really cared about electricity before. And all of a sudden, everybody cares um, as soon as they're rolling blackouts. Um, so, I mean, luckily in, in Vermont, we <laughs> have a little bit more of a conservative approach to both infrastructure and, and the market here. So, uh, I don't. I don't think we're necessarily at, at risk um, for for things like that here, but um, I mean, Green Mountain Power is doing a, a pretty phenomenal job of of kind of leading the way in terms of um, what our energy future can can be, um, and including battery storage. So um, that's a long winded answer of saying. I mean, the, the reason why we come to these meetings is specifically to find ways to in, engage with the community in, in, in ways other than paying property taxes. Um, so, so I, I mean, I, I think we, we would really like to engage and, and help you think about your, your rec club as well as um, education for sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I really think about j just the kids because, you know, we we keep saying the next generation is going to figure it out. The next generation is going to figure it out. Well, we're starting to, but, you know, they're really going to have to figure things out moving yeah. forward. And the more information they have, the more they've been exposed to these things, the, the more problems they'll solve, you know. Yeah. Um, Troy, you're reminding me of uh, what you picked out what what Acorn Energy Co-op yeah, well. uh, promised to do. And that is, since they're building a, an array right at the dump, which is right next to the high school, mm -hmm. they, they said they could wire something into... Could you let Nathaniel back yeah. in? I guess you just have to cut out yeah. for a second. Oh, there, there's Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> it really is Lindsay. Oh. Yeah, hey, everybody, um, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Momentary lapse in internet resulted in a, a quarantine, a non-COVID quarantine. We signed you up for six jobs. Don't worry. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you're, you're 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 teaching a class, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking that this could this could be an, a nice mix between all of the solar folks, um, because Acorn said that they will somehow wire something into the school so that students could see in real time what's going on in the array on the dump. Yeah. Um, but then, um, and then they could do something like walk over to the other array at the plateau there and see what's going on there. You know, like, you know, th there, there could be all kinds of educational things around this, I think. Yeah. It's awesome. The, the more of that, the better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to go. And you know what? Oh, okay. I have to go. I want to thank you all so much for uh, 
taking the time and effort to put this all together. Um, yeah. Very helpful for me as a resident, but also as uh, a person who organizes the rec club. And I'm always looking for ways to be involved in town. So I really appreciate um, everybody's effort. So thank you very much. And Sally, definitely Thanks, keep, it, keep in touch with us about opportunities yes. for the rec club to, get into, to get into that thank site. Great. Um, Thanks. Good to see you, Mike. All right. Nice to meet you guys. Definitely. Good, to good, to, good to see you, Troy. Bye-bye. Well, this has been a fun meeting. Oh, I can't hear you, Mike. You're, uh, you're muted. There you go. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm a retired educator here in, Vermont, in uh, Bristol, and we have a solar system here at, at home, and we have um, software, uh, I shouldn't say software, an app, and we're able to download in real time what's happening with our, our system. At the commercial level, is there something similar where, as we talked about, you know, being able to involve schools where you just open up the app and you can see what each panel is being, you know, how much they're generating, um, you know, what did you do for a particular day, month, year, you know, yeah. getting all the graphs and all that kind of cool stuff. Is that available? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we don't monitor down to the panel level like you might on a residential right. structure, but we'll typically monitor to at least the inverter level or in some cases a, like sub inverter level or string level which would be kind of the smallest size might be um, 20 panels. Um, but typically you're talking more like at the inverter level. So you're talking hundred kilowatts, but um, yeah, we absolutely have remote monitoring um, and where we'd be happy to make that. Uh, like a website, the, how, how would we, how would we? Do yeah, that? yeah, we could, we would, we could provide a website um, that would uh, provide access to the production data. Um, more, you know, it's, not quite real time, but it's pretty darn close. We actually have a project that we own in Williamstown that's at the Williamstown High School. Um, you, you, and we you were, you were logged off, but I, I've already let them know. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so we, we provide them with um, with that same data uh, right from the website. So it's actually quite, it would be really easy if uh, Acorn setting up a monitor, if we can help set up a monitor, if you guys wanted that or, if you just wanted to incorporate it in the classroom, like we can absolutely make that happen. It's, it's, um, that's great. Yeah. It's totally shareable. Yeah. Which is really cool. Cause you know, it's, it'd be really interesting to see this project. Um, in addition to the, um, I don't, I don't I'm not sure what acorn is proposing to, in addition to the single axis tracker, we're also seeing a real emergence in what's called bifacial solar modules. So instead of oh, yeah. having glass on one side and a back sheet on the other side, glass on glass so the the yeah. cells can actually take energy from both the underside and the top side and yeah. um it's a relatively new it's it's just a change in manufacturing process but it's uh the combination of of the tracker which helps you shed the snow earlier and a bifacial module which helps you absorb light create current get a little bit of heat in the model the module to dump the snow mm -hmm. we're really we think that a lot of the models are kind of under predicting the production. We're actually going to see this. My guess is that this will be one of the highest producing sites in the state. Um, yeah. that's really cool. Awesome. Well, I like that. I like that concept because uh, I'm tired of climbing up there with a roof rake. Yeah. Yeah. This summer, this winter rather has been absolutely brutal. Um, <laughs> I drive by the town of Waitsfield has an array at our gravel pit and I drive by and I get the emails from our system in Williamstown and it's like the snow just with these cold temps doesn't melt, um, doesn't shed very well. But right. Do you, do you think that um, the tipping will help it shed faster? Absolutely. Is it tip more than? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So your traditional fixed tilt array <clears throat> in Vermont is like between 25 and 30 degrees tilt. Um, and these, uh, and that would be oriented due south, right? So um, what a lot of people don't realize is like what in the summertime, the sun actually gets like to be more than overhead, right? Yeah. So when, when the sun is almost more than overhead, you know, the, the, the angle of the sun coming on your array is not directly perpendicular. So these, 
these arrays being flat oriented north south they track the sun throughout the day like this um which is which is really cool but because they tilt to 60 degrees oh, 60. in wow. either direction they're able to shed um snow a lot more uh easily they get, they're not like mechanically designed to be able to take 12 inches and just kind of shake it off but when they're at that snow angle or that tilt angle and when it's snowing throughout the day, they're going to shed, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Neat. Yeah, great stuff. Cool. Yeah, really good. I'm so glad you guys showed up tonight. It, it was good to hear this again and have a new, you know, slideshow to put out there for people to look at. And cool. And it was very um, concise compact yeah right we had a little practice from last night so yeah so yeah great i gotta ask chris a question before we go sure uh is your uh, family uh originally from the pittsford area it would be a, a parent maybe a father i i'm i'm sitting in pittsford yeah i'm i uh my i don't know which uncle you're referring to or my father but yeah there, there were six yeah uh, my I, Ashley, Ashley, Steve, uh, Jared, Michael, Alden, Jason. Which one? Yeah. Uh, Alden and Jared. I was a soccer coach, so you know the the guys who were involved with Green Mountain Valley. I knew well. Um, oh yeah, great. I was, I was a soccer player, and I grew up in Proctor, so oh, there cool. were a number of connections. Well, great, great to see you. Yeah, great to meet you. Uh, who who is your dad? Ashley. Okay. All right. Yep. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great right on. Well, I hope you guys have a great night. And um, yeah, thanks. You guys, we'll just keep you, you know, we're working with the planning commission on this, um, on, you know, the, the screening commitment. Um, so we'll, we'll just, we'll continue to be in touch with you. Um, and great you know, keep you updated uh, as we kind of move through this process. The next step for us is we're going to be submitting the, the petition, but um, you know, if there are um, questions or you guys can think of, you know, uh, I could talk to um, Leslie, our council about, you know, adding something in there about providing monitoring um, to the high school or providing data. So. And, uh, and I didn't, I didn't get the gentleman's information at the rec club. Great. Um, I should have asked uh, for that. Troy oh. Parody. Yeah. Troy that Parody. Would, Maybe I can get his info and send it to you. That would be great. Um, because we, we can definitely lend a hand there too. Absolutely. Great. Cool guys. Well, nice meeting you. Nice to meet thank you, too. Have a great night. Yeah. Hey, good night. Okay. Buy an electric Yeah, call. thank you. You, too. Nice job. Yeah. Um... <laughs> hey, Sean, we're going to close up now. Thanks so much for recording. And have a good night.